Let me let you in on a little secret that's gonna make you feel better about how you deal with your personal finances. People do some crazy things with money, but no one's crazy. This may sound like a riddle, but the meaning behind this is that money is very subjective, not objective. Everyone has their own experiences of money, their own risk tolerance, their own cultural expectations. We would love to say that personal finance follows certain laws of nature, like thermodynamics or gravity, things you can easily plug into an equation and you get an output. But it's not as predictable as that. There's a lot of other variables that come into play. But that doesn't stop us from being down on ourselves. We put ourselves down when we're behind on credit cards, when we're not investing like others, when we don't make as much money as others. And this creates a vicious cycle where we're overwhelmed by our finances. We get anxiety. So what do we do when we get anxiety? We buy something. We buy something to get rid of that anxiety. The first step out of this vicious cycle is a little bit of self-empathy. We need to cut ourselves some slack because we're not as bad with our finances as we come to believe. These are four reasons why you're not as crazy with your finances as many make it out to believe. Number one, we have societal pressure. Feeling guilty for spending money on societal pressure needs is understandable. But what you also need to understand is that a lot of this societal pressure is beyond your control because it's rooted in our culture expectations and our DNA to be accepted by that society. These are several reasons why someone should not feel guilty for succumbing to the societal pressure. Number one, we have social conditioning. This societal pressure is deeply ingrained in our cultures and social expectations. Society has bombarded us with media, advertising, social media. The constant needs to be conditioned in this social manner, it's understandable why eventually we give in. Number two, desire for acceptance. It's in our DNA since we go back to when we were cavemen that we need to be accepted by society because this was a evolutionary survival technique. Today we're not as worried about starving to death in a village, we're more so are we going to find a mate? Are we going to find peers to grow and build with? So this is why we have a desire for acceptance and this is why we eventually cave in to societal pressure to buy things because we need to be accepted. And this desire for acceptance can also be influenced by what what your profession is. For example, doctors and dentists, they go out and they buy things that they don't necessarily need because they need to look a certain way. Number three, limited alternatives. Unfortunately, the way society has it now, there's a lot of pressure on going with one option versus the alternative. The alternative is the cheaper route, the less expensive route, and the route that's not accepted. For example, you can keep the same iPhone that you have for the last 10 years, but you're going to be looked at as less of. Or you can get the new iPhone that everyone's talking about. Even though the camera's the same, the screen's the same, everything Things the same, but if the phone's outdated, you're outdated. Our emotional well being. When we ignore these social pressures to fit in, we eventually become ostracized. When you don't keep up with the latest trends that society has and you don't buy the nicest stuff, you're not fitting in with a certain group, and then eventually you're a loner. So while it's important to prioritize financial health, your spending habits, it's also very important to prioritize your emotional and mental well-being. This is why we eventually splurge and binge on spending or going out with friends because that gives us a way more satisfaction of life than saving up for a rainy day. It's crucial for us to practice some self-compassion because like I said, it's out of our control how much society can contribute to our decision making. Everyone experiences some external struggles with their spending. So it's okay to acknowledge that you did spend a little bit more this month and you weren't as good with your financial decisions as you could be because it's out of your control. Navigating social pressure is very, very complex. Instead of feeling guilty all the time, try to develop a relationship that's healthy with money. Understand that it comes and goes, you do need to be smart with it, but you don't wanna be so frugal that it ruins all societal ties that you have. The second reason that we're not as crazy with our money as we think is we are born in an era of spend, spend, spend. If you are a millennial or a Gen Z, in the past 10 years or so, you have taken a beating from the media on your spending habits. They blame it on your Starbucks order, they blame it on your avocado toast, but they don't really look at the big picture. So let's take a quick look at the comparisons of Gen Z millennial versus then if you're a boomer. Our favorite these days, the cost of living. So yes, we're told that things cost way more today than they did back then, but how much are we actually talking about? So let's pretend that you are a millennial or Gen Z buy a house, 22 or whatever, just like when they were fresh out of high school or college. In 1970, the median salary was about $9,800. Today, the median salary is $52 thousand dollars. That's a pretty big jump. We're looking at probably a five time jump within the last 50 years or so. But the numbers really don't add up when we start looking at the other aspects of the cost of living. In 1970, the median house was $23,000. So the average home was about 2.4 times the cost of what you make take home. 
Today, the median house is about $400,000, and it could be way more if you leave in a coastal market. So today, your average house costs eight times the median salary. So while the income has gone up about five times, the cost to get your median house has gone up 17 times. And now let's throw in one of the biggest expenses, student loan debt. In 1970, the average student loan debt was $1,070. It's so tiny, it doesn't even show up on the graph. Today, it's about $37,000. And that does not take into account a lot of the medical professionals, the law professionals, dentists that are taking on so much debt. I have friends that are graduating from NYU dental school with about $500,000 in debt, and that doesn't include undergrad. Those just two expenses alone, house and student loan debt, are astronomically more today than what they were in the past, even if you take into inflation and everything. The next two kind of tie into each other. We have lifestyle expectations. Generations today are often very influenced by cultural and societal expectations. This causes them to buy more and spend more on experiences, different things that they can post on social media. This can lead to spending on travel, spending on dining, spending on concerts, music festivals, things like that. This is very different than the lifestyle expectations that a baby boomer had. Their priorities were start a family, get a home, and that's it. They didn't emphasize experiences because they didn't have as much access to it. Travel wasn't what it was then as it is now. So all their money went towards a home and went to fixing up that home as opposed to the experiences that millennials and Gen Zs have today. And a big reason for that change in what money went towards is the influence of social media today. Generations today would much rather spend their money on an experience that they can show off on Instagram than starting a family. In 2023, Forbes magazine came out with an article that talked about how social media affects our spending habits on travel and experiences. In the first part of the study, they talked about how nearly half of travel decisions were influenced by social media. 82% of Gen Z in this study said they are traveling to a destination simply because they saw it on social media. When in reality, that landmark is most likely edited on social media to where there's no one in the photo, perfect sunlight, perfect everything. A baby boomer doesn't even know this existed in their time. 74% of these respondents said they want to at least emulate what they see in social media. That means going to a certain location, take an exact picture that they can put up exactly in social media just to get some likes. Baby boomers didn't have this influence. They didn't need to go to a certain spot and a certain destination. If they got a vacation once in a lifetime, fantastic. Between millennials and Gen Z, 53% to 79% said they have determined their travel budget just off social media. And the scary part is that ties into all this is 42% of these respondents have gone to credit card debt just to pay for this vacation. Generations today are going to credit card debt just to go on a vacation to show off. Past generations didn't have that. They didn't have the need and the influence for societal pressure to cave into that. And one of the main reasons we spend so much now, aside from vacations and travel destinations, is technological advancements. A generation today cannot go more than three minutes on their phone without getting an ad for something. You're getting an ad for a fitness class online. You're getting an ad for the latest gadget you need, the latest everything. And it's so easy. All you gotta do is just press buy, that's it. You get it shipped within two days. Aside from going to a store or a mall, baby boomers did not have that need to get something that easily. Even an infomercial was complicated. You had to dial. You had to give your credit card over the phone. It was so long and tedious. But today, we don't need that. You can easily get something within two seconds and it creates an instant need to buy, buy, buy. So yes, it's convenient to have the access to anything you wanna buy, but it makes it so easy to just keep spending, spending, spending. But with baby boomers, it was out of sight, out of mind. You didn't buy what you didn't see. Third reason to stop feeling so guilty about your spending habits, our emotions play a way bigger role than we realize. We would like to think that we're making rational decisions when it comes to our money, but in reality, our emotions lead us astray all the time. First off, the number one, Fear. Fear is probably one of the biggest influences that you could possibly have when it comes to investing. You're scared of losing your money more than anything. In 2020, the stock market plunged. People thought the world was ending. 42% of Americans sold a stock just at the beginning. Do you know what happened? Less than a year later, it was back at all-time highs. In that same study, 88% of those that sold the stock at the beginning of that coronavirus crash said they regret it. When we succumb to fear, we're most likely selling at a low 
and then buying at a high. This is a double-edged sword here. You're, you're locking in losses that you got by selling and then you're missing out on future gains. So instead of simply going with the long-term mindset that you keep telling yourself you're gonna do, fear kicks in and says, nope, we're selling. Nope, we don't wanna lose. On the other side of the coin, we have greed. Greed makes us take on excessive risk in hopes of a higher return. We impulsively spend on investments. We are speculating that the next Bitcoin, Dogecoin, whatever is gonna go and make us a millionaire overnight. Warren Buffett once said, to be fearful when others are greedy and to be greedy when others are fearful. So use that wisdom when it comes to greed and fear. When someone's fearful, maybe you should be investing. When someone's greedy, maybe you should not be investing. If it sounds like a get rich quick scheme, most likely is just run for the hills. Third emotion is impulse control. Emotions like excitement, instant gratification, they lead to impulsiveness and lifestyle creep. We succumb to the temptation to want to buy things that detriment our long-term financial goals. So you impulsively decide to splurge on that item. You got the instant gratification of getting something on sale. You got the excitement of getting something nice and you are going to increase your lifestyle. And you decide you'll figure out your finances later. But now your impulsive decision has left you strained financially. So you can't figure it out later. You gotta figure it out now. You have now taken on more financial debt because of this decision, and you are not investing as you should be. And then we have overconfidence. With overconfidence, we are overestimating our abilities, and we are underestimating the risk. Just like with greed, this leads us to overspeculate our returns and underestimate how terrible the fall could be. There was a study done by CNBC. Almost two in three investors rate their investment knowledge highly, and 42% are comfortable making investment decisions. And it goes even the younger you are, the more confident you feel in making these financial decisions where you are probably not always the best. And the last emotion is called loss aversion. With loss aversion, what you're doing, you're avoiding losses. So you would rather avoid a loss than a potential gain. According to Daniel Kamen, the concept of loss aversion is certainly the most significant contribution of psychology to behavioral economics. With this mindset, you never get involved in investing at all. You rather spend that $100 on something you will enjoy than risk losing that $100 in an investment. You are now moving from a long-term approach to a short-term approach. So don't underestimate how powerful your emotions are when it comes to your investments and financial decisions. They are contributing to everything here. And the fourth reason to stop feeling so guilty against yourself is these are your experiences and your experiences alone. Some lessons have to be experienced before they can be understood. You can tell yourself all day long, if you were around 2009, you would have bought a home, you would have been a millionaire today, but no, you wouldn't. Have it lose 50% of its value within a year. You can't say that you would have made the decision to actually buy that. Because like I said before, loss aversion kicks in, fear kicks in, all these emotions kick in and determine a different experience. You can look back at 2000 and say you would never invest in these dot-com companies, but yes, you would. You were following the herd just like everyone else does. So until you actually experience that experience, you can't judge someone else's decisions at that time. And this goes the same with everyone else talking to you about your financial decisions. Like I said before, a baby boomer talking to a Gen Z is apples to oranges. One experience is very different than the other. There was a study done in 2006 by the National Bureau of Research. And they looked at the financial decisions that consumers made over the last 50 years with their money. And what they found, regardless if you're age 20, to 65, all your financial decisions are determined by the experience you have at that moment. As Morgan Housel put in his book, Psychology of Money, not intelligence or education or sophistication, just the luck of when and where you were born, individuals from affluent backgrounds are gonna look at money for investing as a tool, as a method for building wealth. They look at it as a long-term plan, a networking opportunity, a business venture. Conversely, if you're gonna come from a lower socioeconomic background, you're gonna view money with a scarcity mindset as something that needs to happen today, not a long-term mindset. How are we going to have the next meal? So your needs are more immediate than long-term. So this is why the laws of personal finance are not like the laws of thermodynamics or of gravity because there's way more variables involved here. So with your personal finances, you need to look at your experiences alone and determine a game plan. You cannot use the experiences from someone else in determining what you should do. Their experiences are their experiences. Yours are yours. So this is why there's not a perfect game plan when it comes to how to handle your finances. There's a lot more involved than anything in calculus, anything in physics, anything in engineering. Our emotions get involved, society gets involved to influence it, our experiences, our main contributor, and there's a time and when you were born, baby boomer versus now. So my best advice, just pat yourself on the back. You're doing as good as you possibly can with what you're given. So once again, I'm Dr. Mike. 
Keep grinning and keep flossing as if your dentist is always watching.